Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another episode of Reading the Room, a discussion series in which I'm joined by a bookish guest to talk about something bookish. And today I'm joined by Caribou Adams, author of You Never Get It Back, one of my favorite books of 2021. And I think you all watching this will love it too. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Kara. Thank you so much for having me. Before we start, I just want to congratulate you on all of the success that this book has been receiving, including winning the John Simmons Short Fiction Award, which is judged by Brandon Taylor, who is one of my favorite writers and one of my biggest influencers, I will say. Um, I feel like he always, you know, posts about books online, and I tend to always gravitate to, towards whatever he recommends. And this was one that around its release, I saw him posting about. And so I, I picked it up and it just completely blew me away. Um, I'm a big lover of short fiction and this book just does everything that I love. And it's also something that I've never really read before, it being a linked short story collection that also plays with a lot of different forms and tenses, and it's just very exploratory in its telling while also feeling grounded in one character. I guess, how are you feeling since its publication back in December? Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's been just such an overwhelming and happy experience. I worked on the stories for a long time, um, largely by myself and a lot of writer friends who, of course, you know, I was in community with too, but it's a very solitary process. And I guess I never had really imagined what it would be like to share the book with readers um, in any sort of detail. And it's just, it's been really great. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, is it interesting? Um, this is something I, I've had two author discussions now, and I'd like to ask what it feels like to kind of be the sort of like online presence with your book and like talking about it in this kind of setting and trying to like be the voice for a book while it's also, you know, stands on its own. Like, what does that feel like for you in terms of, you know, discussing your intentions or the actual craft of it? Yeah, it's, um, it's a funny experience because it does feel like you're stepping through the looking glass in a way. Yeah. <laughs> um, we move from creating something to, as you say, you know, talking about it in a way that hopefully represents it to other people um, in the way that you intend. Um, it, it's been pretty fascinating. It's also made me realize just how many thoughts I have about each of the stories and about the process of writing. And it's been fun to get to share some of those with people. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why this book, I think, is so interesting to me because each story feels so contained in itself. But thinking about it in like a macro sense of the entire book, it's just so fascinating to, to explore what you do in each story that feels so like full of life and perceptiveness that really, you know, blends with the other stories, but still stands alone. Like it's just so magnificent. So I'm just going to place this book a lot in this discussion. <laughs> um, so I don't repeat myself too much, but I just seriously think it's just a masterpiece. So I guess before we get into questions about the collection, do you mind just um, explaining what the book is about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so almost all the stories in the book follow a single character whose name is Kate Bishop. She's a young woman who grows up in Vermont, in New England. She comes from a family in which there's a fair bit of economic instability. The stories really begin to follow her when she's just graduated from college and she's um, kind of pursuing a, a life in the larger world. First, she becomes a scientist, and then later on, she becomes a writer, and she moves around the country, as I think we often do now, because of job opportunities and, and where life takes us. And so the book is about her romantic life, her trying to figure out her calling and her kind of professional place in the world, her friendships, her relationships with her family. So really everything that, you know, goes into making up a person's life. Um, I wanted it to feel like a multi-dimensional perspective on what it means, you know, to live through your 20s and early 30s um, as a young woman and as this specific young woman. Yeah, and speaking to that, in terms of crafting this collection, how did you decide where to focus on Kate's life throughout, you know, that, that time period? Did, was, it, was it intentional? Did you kind of just find it through themes that you wanted to explore? What did that look like for you? It's interesting. Um, my um, conception of the book really came into being after I'd been writing stories for a fair number of years and publishing them. Um, and so initially some of these stories weren't even explicitly about Kate. There were stories I went back later and decided to make about her and did some revision work with toward that end. Um, but once I put all my stories side by side and chose some of my favorites and showed them to a few writer friends, you know, um, two people said, this is a collection, it's great, you should just, um, you know, publish this. And then two people said, it's really fascinating, there's some similarities between some of the characters, you might make them either into the same character, or move them further apart. And that's really when I thought, oh, you know what, <laughs> I actually do want to make this a proper linked collection. And I want this through line for the reader, because as you mentioned, the stories are so different in terms of where they're set, 
Um, they explore different um, forms, different lengths. Um, so I thought I really do want that strong central through line. So then it was this process of figuring out, well, which stories fit into that constellation? And then I started to see gaps where there hadn't been gaps before. And that was really exciting to, to get to think, well, what do I want to show about Kate's life? What characters from her life might I want to bring together to see what would happen if they met each other? So some of the stories like Never Gotten, Never Had and Desert Light, which is the final story in the collection, came into being that way. I love that. Yeah. And thinking about this as a link story collection, I'm sure that this has been asked a lot, but it's something that I, I think is really, I tend to ask people about form, I guess. And so um, what challenges do you think a link story collection like this present that maybe a novel or short stories don't? One thing, and just to add on to that, I, I was thinking about this before, and I feel like maybe link story collections kind of, in a sense, feel like a fragmentary like novel, not in how it's told, but in the kind of in the gaps that it presents that kind of informs an entire whole. I think thinking about fragmentary structure is really interesting. I feel like there's some kind of connection there, but I don't know. I haven't thought, thought it through too much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the reasons I think the book started to come together the way it did is because I'd chosen these moments of intensity or important moments in the lives of my characters to really kind of shine a spotlight on in each story. And so when I put them together and thought, what if these are the same character? It then made a lot of sense that these would be the moments in her life that I would be telling about. Um, and I think, you know, the linked collection, which I actually teach a graduate course on, I think it's such a fascinating and exciting form. It has kind of um, two levels of technical difficulty. The first is writing um, a short story, which, you know, as I learned when I started to write, is actually tremendously difficult <laughs> um, for me at least. You know, it looks so effortless when someone does it really well, um, but it requires a lot of compression um, and a lot of um, narrative momentum at the same time. You need to make each story really feel like a complete world, give the reader a complete experience, but then you also have to create this larger narrative out of those building blocks. Whereas a novel, you know, sets up some longer lines of tension and some shorter lines of tension and kind of pulls you through that way. I think it was, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Peter Ho Davies who called a novel a machine to keep you reading. That's its job. <laughs> um, the short story, on the other hand, Laurie Moore says, is an end-based form. And what she means by that is in a short story, you have just this little bit, bit of space and you've got to really nail the ending or else the reader is going to feel like, you know, the story doesn't work. A novel, you can get away with a, an ending that maybe isn't quite as um, satisfying as the short story ending really has to be. So balancing those two technical difficulties, creating that kind of beautiful arc of the short story that makes you want to maybe close the book and walk away for a second and just live with what just happened. But then you also need to make the reader walk back, pick up the book, read the next story, and really feel like it's continuing that larger arc. Yeah, and that's what I love so much about this book, too, is I really wanted to know what was going to happen to Kate by the end of the collection. I think that's a really interesting way to center it on one character who I just loved so much. When I started reading this collection, I always know it's a good collection when I take notes on every single story that I read, and that's something I did here. I have a huge note in my notes app of like my reflections and thoughts on this. And so I was thinking maybe we could just go into um, a bunch of the stories here and just discuss them. And I wanted to start with uh, the story Charity. And so this one follows Kate going back to Vermont for Christmas um, after her first semester. And she with her mom and her nine-year-old sister, and they're going to visit Kate's grandma. And the story is this really interesting or proposes this conflict of Kate's mom not wanting to give her family anything for Christmas and donating to charity instead. And to me, it really looks at exploiting one form of loss to kind of barter or exert power over other family members through guilt and competition. And so in this story, we learn about, about Kate's family dynamics while also looking at another form of loss and e exploiting it. And I just wanted to know, did you intentionally approach the story with this look at exploiting loss in this way? Or does it start with character and exploring um, her mom and sister? Where did that kind of uh, grow from? Yeah, it's so interesting to think about loss in that story. Um, I'll say just briefly, the collection begins with a story called I Met Lost the other day, which is a fabulous story about what it means to lose things. And I think of each story as exploring loss in, in some way, sometimes a very subtle way. Yeah, and in charity, you know, Kate's family has, um, you know, kind of hit a rough patch financially. And Kate's mom feels pretty angry about um, how her family has related to that fact. And yes, she, the story opens with her proposing that they'll give, 
um, Kate's mom proposing that they'll give um, their relatives nothing for Christmas <laughs> and donate money to charity instead. Um, I think I started with um, the characters really. Um, I started with that situation of coming back home from college, which is such an interesting moment in a person's life because you've been building this new life in a new place with new friends, um, constructing a new identity in some ways. And then you come back to your old life <laughs> where people don't know the person you're becoming. So I thought it was interesting to put Kate in that moment, coming back home from college from winter break, um, and then to begin with a conflict, because that's always a great way to start a short story. So Kate isn't convinced that this is the best idea in the world. <laughs> and um, throughout the story, we're moving up to the moment in which Kate's mom will reveal to her relatives that um, she's gotten them nothing for Christmas. Instead, she's donated money to charity. Yeah, and I'll leave the ending as a surprise. I really liked uh, what you do <laughs> with, with that ending. It was really, um, it was entertaining, but also it was really interesting kind of teeing up this really fraught family dynamic that we do see in later um, stories as well and how that kind of informs Kate's decisions and her perceptions of life and her relationships. It all kind of informs each other, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, another story that I really loved was Foothills of Tucson. Um, I currently live in Arizona, and so I loved um, the location of and just you exploring kind of that scene setting um, in Arizona was really awesome. And the story is one of my favorites because it switches form and it's told in the form of a, a letter written to Kate's ex. And she's really reflecting on, she's not going to send it to him, um, but she is reflecting on the lost opportunity of love and her feeling that she still loves this person, but thinking about what it means to have lost that opportunity in a sense. And really thinking about even if she went back to to him or she also explores the idea of going back to Boston um, for research just thinking about whether that would actually change anything or whether loss is like this inherent necessity of life and what can you do to kind of avoid it or is it even worthwhile to avoid that um, can you talk about your process for, for this story and you know forming it in the form of a letter yeah um, I love what I think of as like first person addressed stories yeah and um, I find it's just an experience I've had throughout my life of feeling close to someone or um, missing someone and then starting to address my thoughts to them. And it creates a kind of intimacy on the page, I think, which I really love. That's something I look for in stories, precision, intimacy, that kind of emotional charge. And, um, and the Arizona landscape is one I really love. It's set in Tucson, which is a place I've lived. And, um, and it's a place that's so different from Vermont where I grew up. Um, and so it was a place where I found myself often kind of casting my thoughts out to other people, I think, in part because a kind of homesickness um, was part of the experience of ultimately coming to really love Tucson, but at first feeling a little bit displaced there. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing that you do throughout this collection is place Kate in a variety of settings, um, in addition to exploring different relationships. And so it, I think that helps kind of make this book always feel exciting with every story because you don't know where Kate's going to be, what the form is going to be. Um, it's just constantly surprising. I think that's so rewarding to read in a collection like this and it was just so fresh to me. Another one is Never Gotten, Never Had. This is what I call like the friendship story of the collection in terms of her going to Mexico with her friend. Is it Esme or Esme? Esme. Um, Esme, yeah. And they have a really interesting friendship to say the least. Um, <laughs> Esme is a bit of for lack of a better word, kind of a mess in a sense. Um, she is sort of this like foil to Kate in that she seeks to gain control over her life through appearances, um, money, superficiality. And Kate both envies her friend for this, but also kind of feels a sense of pity for her, it seems like. And in the background of the story, she's going to Mexico with uh, Esme and she has she's in a relationship and she's not really too in love with him, it seems. And he kind of understands that. And looking at this friendship as framed through looking at this relationship, it's a really interesting setup that you made for the story. And so can you talk about this one and how you crafted Esme and where she kind of fits in Kate's story? Yeah, Esme was such a fun character to write. Um, at some point, I actually thought about doing a whole series of stories about Kate and Esme. Um, so for me, when you put them together in a room, you just automatically start to see new things about the other and tension just develops really naturally. Yeah, you're right. Kate is a character who I think um, you know, has to be very self-contained has to think very carefully about the decisions she makes in life. Whereas Esme, you know, she ends up pursuing a graduate degree for a while I and mean, she's an excellent student. She's very smart. She's not shallow. But on the other hand, she does also love appearances and has an idea about what kind of life she wants to have and feels entitled to it. 
And so if something is not working for Esme, she just throws it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Kate could never make that kind of choice um, for a lot of really practical reasons, as well as just, you know, um, her own personality. Um, so it was, you know, um, I guess that was one of the last stories that I wrote in the collection. And as I looked at the stories I'd written already, Esme comes up in the second story in the collection, You Never Get It Back. And um, I just thought, oh, I want to bring her back because um, again, those are two characters who just put pressure on each other and really kind of reveal each other through contrast, which I think could be so great. Instead of thinking about having two characters overtly in conflict with each other, that's often not how our lives unfold, right? We don't usually find ourselves in overt conflict with a bunch of people <laughs> in our lives. Um, to think instead about characters who contrast with each other and who bring out each other's differences in various ways and to, to put them together. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's always interesting, like throughout this collection, thinking about this friendship in contrast with even her relationship with her sister, relationship with her mom, and then also her various relationships that she, um, that she has throughout the throughout the book it's really I don't know I, I feel like this French I feel like friendship is something that I love seeing explored in fiction and so I think it's really interesting to see how that is not just you know the sole exploration too um but how it really seems to be kind of fundamental to Kate's character too this friendship that really kind of follows her throughout her life and so and so going back to her sister and mom the story the sea latch I love this, this story so much. It's another one where we're in a new location. Um, it's by the beach and um, her sister is now 19 and she's pregnant and she's going on a trip to a seaside motel with her mom and her sister. And this story really explores Kate's mom a lot, I found. It explores her um, her being quite reserved and it seems to be unhappy. And a recurring event in the story is Kate's mom always wants to go to the motel's Pool rather than actually going to the ocean and seeing it. And it's sort of hinted at that she always wanted to have um, a seaside house and how this kind of idea of loss of that opportunity weighs on her mom. And it also looks at the question of Kate's sister battling to have a child and the question of whether, whether to have a child. And this idea of lost familial connection and secrets that we have in families is something really interesting. So how did you go about writing this one? Yeah, it's interesting to think about that in contrast with the the story never got never had because Esme represents this new world Kate is starting to move in where people have more money and more privilege and just a, there's a different sort of set of cultural values and then in the sea latch um, we see her with her family and so it looks in a way back at Kate's past um, yeah Kate's mother has this kind of desire for this house you know overlooking the ocean which she would never be able to afford um, and it feels to me in that story like um, the mother is almost like afraid to think too much about that desire, to let that desire become too real, because then she would have to confront the pain of knowing that it could never become real. Um, and so rather than go see the ocean, um, she stays by the motel pool and, and Kate keeps saying, hey, don't you wanna come and actually see the ocean? You say you love it. It's the closest you can get to this fantasy. And the mother really resists that. Um, and Kate's sister Agnes, I think, is working out a different relationship to desire. She, you know, she's trying to sort out whether she wants to have a baby. She's decided she does, but there's some ambivalence there. Um, and she's going forward that in a, you know, um, at the age of 19 without a um, job or um, you know, stability. Um, there's a kind of reckless, I think, with which she is pursuing that desire. Um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think there are good and bad things <laughs> about um, being able to throw caution to the wind when pursuing something that you want. Um, but we see Kate, who's I think often very measured in terms of how she pursues her desires, looking both at her mother and at her sister and thinking about their own relationship with their lives and what it is they want. So I love this story because I love stories that explore someone deciding to be a parent. I recently read Sheila Hetty's Motherhood. Um, and I don't know if you've read that book, but it was an instant favorite of mine. And this idea of Agnes, she really, um, in, in the decision to become a parent, she's thinking about what her boyfriend wants, what her mom wants, and kind of also being a daughter and how that all kind of plays together. And I think that's a really interesting, I don't really have a question about it. I just liked how it was explored in the story. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, I just wanted to compliment you on that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think it's such a fascinating question and one that maybe has been like underwritten a little bit. It's um, motherhood, for example, 
by Sheila Hetty is one of you know my favorite books of the last couple of years, definitely. And it explores things that I think are so fundamental um, in terms of our conceptions of self and our lives. Um, the question whether to become a parent is such a crucial one. Um, and um, at the same time, I'd never seen a book explore that before. So I was really excited to see motherhood. And yeah, it's something my book touches upon just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a question of like the, again, lost opportunity of if you don't decide to go forward with it, like what do you lose through that? And if you do become a parent, what do you also lose? But I think one thing that this collection does as well is while it is rooted in loss and this idea of the kind of sadness or like grief that can come with a lost opportunity, a lost um, family member, Etc. Also, what is gained by by a loss, and the, you know, also the happiness that can come with loss, and the inherent inevitability is something that can also bring joy or um, or happiness. And so, I think that's a really interesting exploration of loss that I'd never really considered before, and it kind of opened my mind to <laughs> how loss is not just this one you know negative thing. I think this book really explores all those things beautifully. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's something I was thinking a lot about. You know. Um, can't remember who it was, but someone um, said vis-a-vis -vis the question of whether to have a child that there's going to be something to mourn either way. Either you mourn the life you could have had with more freedom and more money and et cetera, et cetera, the things you gain by not being a parent, or you mourn that kind of depth of relationship and transformative nature of um, having a child. And I think so many questions in life are that way. By choosing one thing, you give up something else. Um, and of course, as you move through life, you leave people behind, you leave places behind. It's just the nature of time and what it means to be a person. Um, and so I did want to, you know, give the reader um, not just sadness or an exploration of loss, but also um, humor and joy and a sense of possibility and hope. And um, that idea that, yeah, you make choices in life and your life takes a shape, but that's also beautiful and necessary and good. Absolutely. And that really that tees up the next story, which has some of my favorite sentences in the entire book. It's shoulder season. And this one is essentially about Kate deciding to become a writer and kind of leaving behind her previous career that she wanted to pursue. So the, a quote from the story is, I wanted a chance to become someone new. And it, she talks about how becoming a writer sort of came to her as like an epiphany, like finding, finding a love and how it just kind of came to her. And so I wanted to know in crafting the story and Kate, did, did that come to as an epiphany to you that she was gonna be a writer or did you always know that the character would end up going in that direction? It was an epiphany to me. <laughs> oh, nice, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was something that came about when I put my stories together and saw, oh, well, in some there are characters interested in science and some there are characters who are writers um, and plenty of you know stories in which people do neither, but, I find science fascinating. I find writing fascinating um, for some similar reasons, I think, actually. And I came to think, yeah, it would be so interesting to have this character who did one thing and then did the next thing as, um, you know, in real life, um, Brandon Taylor did. Um, and Waiki Wang, another writer I really love and admire, she studied science very seriously before becoming a writer. Um, so it was fun to make that, um, you know, to have that revelation about Kate and then to um, carry it through the book. Yeah, it, it was exciting to read because like myself, I'm 26, I'm a lawyer, and I don't know, it just makes me think about like, what potential changes that can come in your life that like, maybe I'll be something completely different in three years time and with that, like, like the quote I mentioned, she wants to become a, like a new person, this idea of how much of our life is just kind of subject to potential epiphanies or just chains, changes of whim that, you know, you would decide to go in a different direction. And I think it's really exciting to explore in fiction and kind of see a character pursue that and what that looks like for her and, and also framing it in her past and how it all kind of blends together. Um, I loved how that was explored here. In addition, in the story Vision, Kate, we see her at an artist residency and she meets an elderly painter who is um, partially blind. And this story really explores what I found to be craft and what it means to create and the challenges that Kate has in, in craft and also kind of contrasting that and comparing it to the painter with this disability and this loss of ability and the worth of craft in pushing forward no matter what. And this story was so interesting in that it's quite different from the rest. And how did you go about um, writing this one? Um, so that story came out of a residency that I did myself um, at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Um, and I wrote um, another story there, The Most Common State of Matter. 
But at the same time, I loved the location and I met some really interesting people. And so I started just jotting down some details um, in a kind of diaristic way. And then a couple of years later, um, I did another sort of self-made residency um, in this beautiful home designed by an architect in North Carolina. And something about the light and the place just made me go back to those notes and decide to do something with them. I've always found visual art really fascinating. I did a lot of um, you know, studies in art history in college. I worked in museums for a little bit. And um, to think about a painter and a painter losing his vision um, was just really, really fascinating to me. I love that in every story, I was so shocked to see how you could explore this question of loss in a completely new way that I hadn't really thought about before. And so I think that is, you know, contrasted with a story that comes next, seeing clear that is so head on about losing someone in your life, um, meaning Kate's father. And this one explores her father's um, depression and suicide attempts and how it impacted her childhood and her development as a woman. And a question I wanted to ask you about this story is, I think I've personally been thinking a lot about the discourse recently about like trauma plot and fiction and how trauma is explored in fiction. And I really liked how this this entire collection really looks at this idea of Kate's trauma, but it doesn't really, I feel like it addresses it so directly and really contains the many nuances of what that means for Kate. And I just wanted to, to know how you wanted to write about trauma in this book. Yeah, um, I think I'm seeing Clear, which is a story about Kate's childhood. It's fun to think about the childhood stories. Um, there aren't many, um, but to think about using them a little bit like backstory in a novel. Um, and so I decided to put that story fairly late in the collection, in part because I didn't want the whole book read through the lens of, you know, those fairly traumatic childhood experiences. Um, and in part because it just felt intuitively right as the reader gets to know Kate better, this intimacy builds, I hope. And then this very painful thing finally kind of comes forth once the reader knows her pretty well. Um, yeah, I, I find those discussions about the trauma plot so fascinating. Um, and I've seen you um, comment sometimes about it. Um, and I've been really glad to see your thoughts about the trauma plot um, alongside um, Carl Sagels, for example. Um, you know, to me, trauma is important. It's interesting. Um, a risk I think that we run when we write about trauma is flattening a person into a traumatic experience, which um, I think does um, the person a disservice and does the reader a disservice too. So I really wanted Kate to be, you know, a full human being, complex, surprising, way more than the sum of what's happened to her, because there's always what happens to us and then how we meet what happens to us, um, which is, you know, incredibly dynamic and unpredictable. Um, so I wanted to weave that in as a thread, but also continue to surprise the reader and not to reduce or flatten Kate in any way. Yeah, and it's so interesting that you say that because I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the upcoming stories in the, in, on my list and that what you just mentioned ties in so well to the most common state of matter in which Kate has a new friendship that is under pressure of a cancer diagnosis um, in thinking about mortality and, you know, things that can just come up in your life that really make you question your mortality and choice in the future and this kind of threat of imminent loss in this story was really interesting to kind of see how Kate navigates this friendship that she could potentially lose soon and what that means. I guess, how, how do you craft the story? Yeah, um, I was thinking there about dialogue and about humor. So one thing that I hope is that the book is funny too. <laughs> um, I always find sad stories are often, you know, my favorites if they're leavened with some humor. And there I wanted to write a friendship in which Kate is like very much on the same page with this friend, unlike with Esme, um, who she also loves, but has a very different relationship with. Um, and I wanted to explore, um, yeah, um, a kind of funny banter between the two characters. Um, so that was kind of the starting point. Um, I thought of some of my wittiest, funniest friends, various things they'd said, um, and then gave them to the two characters <laughs> to develop the sort of rapport between them. And then I had the idea of um, putting sort of two kinds of pressure on the characters. One is um, Kate's friend, um, Josephine, um, you know, is having this kind of health scare. And then the second is that eight, Kate's um, new boyfriend, newish boyfriend, um, brings up the idea of getting engaged. And so on the one hand, this very hopeful um, moment in a person's life where you look forward to a future with somebody else. Um, on the other hand, um, the potential of loss 
and I let those both um, kind of play out side by side throughout the story. Yeah, and I, I do think this book is quite funny throughout, and I really like that sense of levity that that was brought to the story in particular. I really love that you explored that too, and I, I like how surprising the story is too by the end of it. I'll leave it as a surprise for <laughs> readers what happens to these characters, but this does lead into the final story of the collection. I did skip a few, but I have a couple questions on the ones that I that I glossed over um, just because they're doing something interesting with form. But um, this last story, Desert Light, I will not go into the plot of the story. I'll leave it as a surprise for readers. <laughs> but um, I do think Desert Light, the story is the most hopeful I find out of the collection. And I think in a sense, like necessarily so, I, I really liked, you know, seeing where Kate ends up at the end of this collection and still sh showing Kate throughout, you know, all the experiences that she's had, all the relationships that she's gone through, ones that she still has or she has lost, she really ends on a hopeful note and thinking that that she's still excited to, to think about the future and seeing what the world holds for her. And I just, at the end of it, I wrote, um, gorgeous, I'm obsessed. <laughs> um, so I think that's a good, I don't know, sign of the, of the story, you know, concluding the collection. But um, did you always intend to end on this like hopeful note for the collection or did you, through writing this kind of come to these, I'm always curious about like, the realizations of writers as they write or if they're just, I don't know. It just seems magical that it ends here, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I did not know it was going to end on a hopeful note at all. And um, an early reader said, you know, I think Kate deserves that and the reader deserves that. And um, I thought at that point I'd already ended on a fairly hopeful note. It ended actually at that point with the most common state of matter. And this reader was like, no, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not hopeful enough. And I thought about it and some of my favorite linked collections, including Olive Kittredge and Jesus' Son, um, you, they explore very difficult material, but they end on a hopeful note. And I actually really love that. And so I knew I wanted more um, desert light in the book. I jotted that down at some point. And I knew I wanted the book to end on a hopeful note after that kind of first reading. And, um, and then, unlike most of my stories, that story actually started with the title Desert Light. I thought, oh, what a great title actually for the story and, and something that I love and find solace and beauty in um, that feels like it leads me in a hopeful direction. And the story kind of developed from there. I also wanted to bring back a number of characters from other parts in the book and to put them together. And that was really the genesis. Yeah, it really, I feel like it ties everything together so beautifully. and. Um, yeah, I mean, not to go back, I guess, but I wanted to ask you about a couple of other stories in here, such as Metaphor, which is very short, um, since it, like flash fiction, and then also At the Wrong Time to the Wrong People. This one, I think my, my understanding is that it's a completely kind of like standalone story in the collection. I thought that was interesting that you included it. So could you talk about those two stories and um, how they kind of work in, in the collection? Yeah, um, yeah, so Metaphor, um came out in part of my admiration of Amy Hempel, um, who writes beautiful stories in just a couple sentences sometimes. She's a minimalist writer. Um, I think you mentioned liking her as well, maybe? I have, I have not read her, actually. Better. Okay. I will, um, though. I feel like you would really love her. Yeah, her book, Reasons to Live, is an amazing place to start. And Anne Beatty and some other writers who sculpt these just perfect tiny stories, Lydia Davis would be another. And so I was experimenting with form. Um, you know, how short can a story be and still be satisfying? And I wrote metaphor. And as I put together the collection, I thought, oh, I've got some stories that are really, really long, like 30 pages, unusually long for a short story. It would be fun to go all the way in the other direction and include this very, very brief story. Um, so that's metaphor. And then at the wrong time to the wrong people is told from Kate's mother's perspective. Um, it's the one story in the book um, about Kate's life not told from her perspective. And there I was thinking about um, ways to keep surprising the reader throughout the book. Um, and a new perspective is one of those ways. And also um, Juno Diaz's linked collection, This Is How You Lose Her, which is all about um, a young man in junior who has a troubled relationship with the women he dates and has to kind of learn how to respect women um, in a way that he hasn't yet learned at the beginning of the book. And halfway through, we actually get a short story from a woman's perspective. And that for me just tilts the book a little bit, um, just kind of realigns the reader's perspective in a way that I love. Um, it lets some light in, in a way. And I thought it would be really interesting to try doing something like that myself. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I wanted to talk about the first story last because um, I feel like it's interesting to just explore what that first story does and like consider it again after you read um, the collection because it's a beautiful introduction and it's really it's kind of mysterious and you're a little unsure where the collection's going to go from there. But basically, it follows um, a tailor, a tailor who is me taking measurements of a man named Loss. Who in the story, it's a bit surrealist, and he documents the losses of people, whether it's um, tangible or intangible and exploring what that means. And I loved that you included this to introduce it. I feel like it was kind of a flex um, as a writer to put this kind of surrealist story to start. And so um, where did this kind of story come for you? Um, that's one of the very first short stories I ever wrote actually. Um, and I did really you know, struggle with whether to include it because you're right, it's an unusual choice. Um, and it asked the reader to really trust me um, because then we moved to Kate and her story. Um, and I'm so glad that it worked for you. I was reading a lot of Calvino and Borges at the time, some fabulous writers who were very intellectual. And um, that first line just presented itself to me. I met Loss the other day, which is also the title. And then I thought, oh, how interesting to personify Loss. What would Loss do if Loss was a person? And I was just sort of delighted by the idea of this character who would catalog everyone's losses and actually keep track and the idea that you could go back and you know potentially look at everything that you've lost over the course of your life. Yeah and, and to conclude on the, the stories the title story you never get it back follows um, and so where did this title come from for you? I think I feel like it's the absolutely perfect title for this collection but I'm always curious to know in terms of stories and just books generally where titles come from um, and how you decide that. I feel like it's such, it's such a huge decision. <laughs> um, but yeah. That's interesting. I don't remember exactly at what point I arrived at that title, um, but it comes from a Hemingway short story, Hills Like White Elephants, very famous. Um, and um, initially I had the characters discuss that story, but I didn't have that line in there. I thought, well, maybe it's iconic enough. People will understand it's a Hemingway reference. And then I showed it to readers. This is why like early readers are invaluable. People are like, no, no, <laughs> people have not memorized that story. <laughs> they will not know where this comes from. And so then I built that title into the story. Um, I have one character actually say it in that discussion about Hemingway so that then it could become the title and people could make that connection. That, that's amazing. Yeah, this, again, this story collection, I'm, I think we talked about everything in here. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. I hope it wasn't too scattered, but I just wanted to I don't know, pick your brain, because I feel like when I review collections, it's so hard for me unless I really at least dive into a few to kind of talk about them, but I felt it would be nice to just get your thoughts on most, if not all of them in this collection. Um, and I guess to conclude, my last two questions are, are there any books that you feel like are in conversation with this that you would suggest readers to maybe pick up if they enjoy this? Basically asking for book recommendations for myself. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, Certainly Olive Kittredge and Jesus' Son. Perhaps you read those or both. Actually, I own Olive Kittredge and I have not read Jesus' Son, but I want to. Yeah, um, they're both terrific. Um, I also really love Sarah Majka's Cities I've Never Lived In. Um, she's a short story writer I really admire. I think that book might be up your alley if you liked my book. Okay, um, awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to think who else. There are so many. Jhumpa Lahiri, um, her first collection, especially Interpreter of Maladies. Have you read those yet? I've only read on um, whereabouts actually. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, so, which is really interesting. It's a departure for her. Yeah, I really like that. And just, like the kind of wandering feel of it, it was really interesting. Um, and the different, you know, vignettes. I like that kind of style, so. Yeah, she's a gorgeous writer, very elegant. Um, and those short stories feel very um, classic, I think. Um, but it's one of my favorite collections probably of all time. So those would be three places to start. Great, thank you. Yeah, and my last question in all these discussions is, can you give um, a current read that you're that you're reading and if you have any thoughts on it, and then a recent read that you loved and then one that you're looking forward to? So current, recent, looking forward to. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm currently reading Cold Enough for Snow um, by Jessica Ah. Have you read that? I just that? read that, yeah, a couple weeks ago and I adored it. It was, I loved it. Yes, another just like gorgeous, gorgeous book. So precise, so quiet but fascinating, um, which is something I really love. Um, a book like that it just felt utterly real, but also distilled in the perfect way. I'm like two thirds or three quarters of the way through. A book I recently loved, I'll say I just um, actually reread two books that I loved in the past and loved even more the second time, Kafka's The Trial. <laughs> 
um, which just makes you reconsider your entire life. <laughs> um, and I feel like everyone should read that once every decade or something. It's like a good sort of bracing um, read. Uh, it's also very funny. And Play It As It Lays, the Joan Didion novel, um, which my partner had actually bought for me for Christmas. And then when we got the news um, that she died, he decided to give it to me early, <laughs> um, which was really sweet of him. And um, I reread it and was just, she's just a genius. She's brilliant. And um, looking ahead, the person who actually recommended Cold Enough for Snow to me is a writer named Madeline Lucas. Um, and her first novel is coming out in a year or a year and a half. And it's called, I think, Thirst for Salt. Um, which comes from the Robert Haas poem that initially provided my book with its epigraph before I changed it to the Marilyn Robinson epigraph. Um, and so I feel like Madeline and I have very similar taste um, and I'm really excited to read, um, yeah, read her yet to be published novel. Awesome, yeah, I'll have to add it to my list. Um, and also with Kafka, I've never read Kafka. I often see like in blurbs that like things are described as Kafka-esque and I would love to read him to actually know what that means. I think I know what it means, but I think I need to actually read him to kind of understand the nuance there of what that really, what he's exploring um, in, in his work. But I will have to, I, I own the trial. I just haven't read it. The story of my life is I have too many books that I haven't read <laughs> and I read so much, you know, like current recent releases. I really want to make it a focus to read some older um, backlist titles as well. But yeah, thank you for sharing those. Yeah, absolutely. And so that concludes my questions. Thank you so much for joining me today. Ever since I picked this up, I was, I've been hoping, like my goal with my channel was to start author discussions. And um, after reading this, I was like, I hope Carol will come on my channel and talk to me about this because I just think it's, it's so great. So thank you for taking the time. It shocks me that writers want to chat with me or are open to chatting with me. So just thank you so much. That was a total pleasure. Thank you. And everyone, um, I'll leave a link below in the description to purchase this um, if you don't have it already. Definitely check it out. As I've said many times, it's one of my favorite books of last year, and um, I think you all enjoyed as well. So thank you, Kara. Thank you, Jalen.